Well, it's always an honor when I get to speak to veterans. It's a special honor when I get to speak to fellow Marines, especially on our birthday. And let's try this one more time. Happy birthday, Devil Dog. <laughs> My message today is a pretty simple one, but one that I hope that stays in the hearts of every Marine and every person here that hears it. Being a Marine is a privilege very few people will ever understand. It's an honor bestowed on the finest of the finest, a minute fraction of our population. Like we said earlier, I spent eight years in the Marine Corps and another 20 in the Army. A lot of my best jobs in the Army were because I was a Marine. As a matter of fact, one of them, I was selected as an aide-de-camp to Major General James Kelly. General Kelly was a deputy commander in general of operations for Coalition Forces Land Component Command. And that's a mouthful of some of you can't uh, you know, use some mouth to see. This was in Iraq uh, around 05 to 06 time frame. I was one of 12 captains select selected to compete for this position. I did my research and I learned that General Kelly graduated from West Point and there was another West Point grad captain that I was competing with. I was sure as a West Point grad, General Kelly would pick the other ring knocker. Well, he did, he picked me. Later when I asked General Kelly why he selected me over the West Pointer, he said there were two reasons. He said one, because the other captain was a West Pointer and because I was a Marine. He said he knew whatever he needed done would get done and get done right. That's how the other branches see the Marine Corps and how the world sees us. The values and ethos we learned while in uniform set us apart from the rest of the world. Our honor, courage, and commitment. That's how we served our country and how we still live our lives. Marines have served our country for nearly two and a half centuries. In our 248 year history as a Corps, our devil dogs have been in armed conflict for 226 of those years. That's about 92% of the time that we've been a Marine Corps, our men and women have been in harm's, been in harm's way. Marines spent the early part of 1776 raiding British shipping lanes and territories in the Caribbean. During that time, the Corps participated in its first amphibious landing the first battle of Nassau in the Bahamas. Since then, we've served in all kinds of places. Iwo Jima, Normandy, the Chosen Reservoir, Ashaw Valley, Fallujah, and hundreds of other places. With all this activity, less than 1% of our population ever served in the Marine Corps. To be more specific, it's 8 tenths of 1% of our population can call themselves Marines. At some point, these men and women leave the military, but they don't leave their core values of honor, courage, and commitment. According to a Pew Research Center, as many as 44% of those who served had a difficult time transitioning back to civilian life. Drug and alcohol abuse and suicide rates are statistically higher among veterans and specifically Marines than those who never served. It's been reported that it takes an average of eight years to fully transition back to civilian life after being in the military. For many, the war we faced while in uniform didn't end when we left the military. The battles we face now are as bad, or in some cases worse, than the battles we faced in uniform. I was one of those whose battles were worse when I got out. I struggled with my transition from the military. In the beginning, I thought I was fine. I had a great education, great training, and I felt like I had pretty good skills. I had some pretty good contacts, so I expected I would find a job on the outside and it'd be nothing more than another permanent change station. I was wrong. It was nothing like a PCS. With a change of station, I would go from one unit of similar people to another unit of similar people. I always had at least a few days, sometimes a few weeks, to transition and in process, get to know the base, get to know the people, maybe transition with the person I was replacing. Well, that was not the case with my new assignment as a civilian. My first job, after I retired, I was a dean at a small college here in Georgia. My first day, I was told the man I replaced had quit two months earlier, and nobody had done the job since he left. 
I was given a key to the door, a polite smile, and they were gone. That was my introduction to civilian life. At the time, I was still dealing with the injuries of my last deployment and who the new me was. Although my injury had been more than six years earlier, I had just left the traumatic brain injury clinic a few weeks before my retirement and the start of my job as a dean at the college. On my last trip to Iraq, like was mentioned earlier, in about in 2006, I was injured far worse than I thought I was. I remember the Humvee rolling over, and I remember crawling out. I remember this burning feeling on the side of my face like the hundred bees stinging me all at one time. So I instinctively reached up, grabbed my jaw, and kind of gave it a jerk. What I found out was the muscles tightened and it held my jaw in place. Well, I looked around and I saw that nobody else was injured. I was the only one, and I was the acting commander at that time. So as an acting commander, I couldn't be the only one injured. So we carried on, we carried on with the mission. But later that night, I was in a lot of pain. I took a shower, skipped dinner, and went straight to bed. Well, sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up and my jaw had relaxed and now was locked open. Well, at that time, I was bunking or sharing a room with a CW3. So I woke him up and asked him if he could help me get to the aid station. Like any good warrant officer, he took one look at me, started to laugh, and said, wait, we have got to get a picture of this. <laughs> well, after a few minutes, he had his fun, but he did get me to the aid station. And as luck would have it, the captain running the aid station was a captain I had gone to my medical officer basic course with. She took one look at me and immediately said that I needed to get to a bigger hospital in Germany. Again, I wasn't happy with that answer. Remember, I was the acting commander. I was too important to be medevaced out. After a few minutes of tense negotiating with her, she agreed and let me stay. She gave me a big bag of drugs and sent me back to my unit. I lasted maybe three weeks and I couldn't handle the pain any longer. I went back to see her, <clears throat> and within a few days, she had me on an airplane home. When I arrived in the Atlanta area, they sent me to Fort Gordon, where the Eisenhower Hospital is located. We discovered I had extensive damage to the right side of my face. Ultimately, I had my right eye socket rebuilt, both cheekbones were replaced with implants, my nose was rebuilt twice, both of my jaws were cut out, rebuilt and put back in, and held in place with four brackets and 20 screws. I've had eight teeth removed to compensate for the crushing injury to my throat. I have permanent nerve damage to my lower face, and I have an artificial chin. Now, my, uh, the reason I wear my goatee is because when they put my chin on, they put it on crooked. And the goatee kind of helps hide how crooked, the, how crooked the chin is. So I had six major surgeries in all, with several minor ones in between. I spent a few weeks in the ICU while my jaws were being cut out, rebuilt, and replaced. During that whole process, my wife, at that time, didn't attend a single surgery or follow-up procedure. In addition, I spent the better part of my last two years, from 2011 to 2013, in a traumatic brain injury clinic at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I went through that whole process alone. Well, let me clarify one point here. The lovely young lady you saw walk down the aisle earlier <clears throat> was not with me at that time. Um, my bride, Nikki, um, and I have been married for five years. I think if Nikki had been with me at that time, they'd have had to surgically remove her from my side in order to do anything any of the work on me. Nikki's the kind of wife that everybody needs, but few people have. I certainly didn't have it at that time. But here's what I can say about that time in my life. Had I not gone through what I did the way that I did, I don't think I would be here the way that I'm here today. Going through that alone made me appreciate what I did have. It made me see what other people had and how they were coping with their issues. I started to notice a trend. I noticed that the ones who seemed to be adjusting well and thriving had a few things in common. The ones who were lacking any of these things, 
didn't do so well. I noticed that if people had social support, they healed faster. The support could come from another service member, ideally a family member, but social support was, a, was critical to their healing. Of course, proper medical care is, is important as well, and we were all getting good medical care at Eisenhower. Faith is another component, another important component. Those who demonstrated strong faith seemed to heal quicker than those who did not. And the last component was a sense of purpose. If someone had a sense of purpose and a reason to get up every day, they tended to have more positive outlook and they healed faster. As I talked to the other service members over the six years that it took to rebuild my face, many had all four, many more did not. I, for example, was strong in my faith. I had a great assignment and purpose, was receiving great medical care, but I had no support. So I was one of those who really struggled with my new identity and ultimately with my healing. I'm reminded of another officer who was injured about the same time that I was. His name is Captain Scott Smiley. Smiley was wounded by a suicide bomber and blinded. He had one thing that I and many of the others did not have. He had a strong support system. He credits his loving, his loving wife with his recovery and his ultimate success. Sadly, too many of our Marines don't have what Captain Smiley had. As I mentioned earlier, homelessness, substance abuse, suicide rates are all higher among, uh, in, in the military than among our civilian counterparts. It was only by the grace of God that I did not end up like one of those statistics. Now, I was angry that my career was cut short. Well, if you call 28 years in uniform short. My plan for my career was not in my future. Instead, I spent hours and hours alone in a hospital, in surgeries by myself, months in rehab, and just, just to, with my mind to keep me company. But it did allow me to develop the concept of the Eden Project. Now, I wish I could say there was one big moment, one flash of light, where it all came together and I, and I understood why I had to go through what I had to go through. But there was no flash of light. Instead, there were glimpses of small pieces of a picture that after 10 years finally came together. God gave me hope, but more importantly, he gave me a purpose. This combined with the values I learned in the Marine Corps became the Eaton Project. Since 2016, the Eaton Project has served well over 1,200 veterans and their families. In one year alone, we intervened in 56 suicides, and I'm happy to say they're all still with us today. We've helped families file VA claims, get VA benefits, and find employment for those and their spouses. We provided thousands of volunteer hours, brought $6 million to our community, but more specifically, the veterans who needed it. So as I wrap up, please let me tie a few of these things together. For 248 years, less than 1% of our nation's population served in the Marine Corps. This small but powerful fighting force has held true to its core values and has kept this country free while allowing the other 99% to sleep in peace every night. We run major corporations, hold political office, and yes, run nonprofits. So where are you tonight? Do you find yourself close to being one of those statistics? If so, call me. Call somebody, but make the call. If you find yourself wanting to serve a greater calling than yourself, give me a call, I'll put you at work. Are those Marine Corps values speaking to you to do something? If so, give me a call. In 1945, Admiral Nimitz said, among the men who fought on Iwo Jima, uncommon valor was a common virtue. It was true then and it's still true today. Simplify. Yeah!